I don't know what year we were in, but it was a long time ago. I could tell that. It, oh, it was. <laughs> Wait a bit, because I was in school as well then, Mike, and I'm 74, so that's many more. Well, God, and I had masses of hair. We are live, Gemma. <laughs> there we go. The meeting has started now. Thank you for starting the recording, Cara. Um, I'm just checking on the attendance list there, Gareth. I don't know if David Jones is in the meeting yet. I think he's on his way. Yeah, I'll call him in now. So. There we go. Lovely. Uh, right. OK, so let's uh, crack on with the agenda. Uh, welcome to this Education and Skills Policy Development Committee. It's Wednesday, the 19th of January. Can I ask first off, please, for any apologies for absence? I've had none yet, Chairman. Sorry. OK, thank you. Um, any disclosures of personal and prejudicial interests? I, I'm always paranoid about this part of the agenda and I always mention things that I think are relevant and often I think in the legal context probably not. But I should declare that uh, I work for the University of Wales Trinity St David and my colleague and friend Dr Nalda Wainwright is able to join us this afternoon. So I, I'd like to just say that so uh, you know that we work for the same organisation. Thanks Chair. Uh, moving on to agenda item number three, the minutes of the last meeting. Can I ask, uh, are we content to approve the minutes of the meeting held on 15th of December 2021? Can we go through page by page, please? Is page, page number one, page number two, and page number three. If we are content, then can I uh, have your approval to sign the minutes as a correct Move record? Thank you very much, Jan. Second. OK, so we're moving on to agenda item number four, which is a position a statement um, on a sport and health service partnership with education. And I am really uh, very pleased indeed to be able to welcome uh, Dr Nalda Wainwright to the meeting. And there is honestly no one better placed to introduce this important agenda item. Uh, I think fair to say without being uh, over complimentary uh, in in our region, in Wales, in the UK and I think internationally. So on that note, can I pass over to Dr Nalda Wainwright, who is the director of the Wales Academy for Health and Physical Literacy? Wow, there's a build up. Uh, you'll see why, Des, you'll see why. Follow that. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, you're too kind. Um, I, I'm so pleased to be able to come and talk to you all because, I, as I said to Mike when he first mentioned this to me, we've done so much work with Swansea already. You really have been helping to drive this agenda and, and leading. We started this work a long time ago down in Pembrokeshire, but it's Swansea and the team through the local authority team, through the early years, through collaborations with the sports development and the early years teams and Public Health Wales in your region where we've probably been driving it and developing it the most. So I'm really pleased to come and talk to you about this and, and say brilliant. And I I have got a little presentation. I hope I won't bore you because it is, it is literally my favourite subject in the whole world. But I think you'll see why it's so important when I go through this, hopefully. Um, OK, so if I am I able to share my content? Yes, hooray. So. Sorry, now, did you see the email? It needs to be bilingual, all the slides. Yeah, it. There, I have had it translated. Can I can I talk through mine? There is translators where I've, there's writing. It's all Welsh on all of them. Does it have to be in your format for me to show it? No, it's just that if there aren't slides that are bilingual, you need to skip over them, please. OK, even if it's like an image that's taken from something that's not that I can't edit. I do, I... Can, I, can I point out that uh, it looks bilingual to me? So so can we uh, carry on with uh, I'm seeing a lot of Welsh and a lot of English. So if you just crack on with it now, then I'm sure it will be compliant. Thank you. Yeah, I, I sent it to our colleague, Kamraig, um, associate to go through and check that we met the, well, the bilingual policy, I know it's different everywhere, but she, she did go through and try make sure that she translated what was possible to be translated. So apologies if there's some of the images that are taken from other sources, I, ca I can't edit them at all. Um, so I, as in these news, <laughs> news websites, which uh, we were familiar with this long before the pandemic, this is kind of the context 
for our, for our work is this idea of what we're facing in terms of challenges. Uh, and one thing that's particularly interesting here is that you see that in this news flash that happened way back in 2017, there was a sort of an outcry about evidence showing children dropping out of physical activity as young as seven years old. And you'll see from the work that we do is that we can explain why that's happen and happening and also the relationship into that lifelong health problem, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but our, all of our work is situated within the field of physical literacy, and some of you will have heard of this term before, I'm sure. Others may not be familiar with it. I think the exciting thing for me about physical literacy was, A, a it was my original research with a woman called Margaret Whitehead, who kind of started the world chatting about it, certainly in, in the recent sort of view of it. But for me, physical literacy is super important. I, I'm, I come from a physical education background, although sport was always a big driver for me. But for me, the brilliant thing about physical literacy is like we don't teach physical literacy. You might have heard someone saying, oh, I'm teaching. But nobody teaches physical literacy. You can't teach it. It's something that we develop from the other stuff that we're taught or the other things that we experience. So a bit like literacy, you may have heard people saying, oh, I'm teaching literacy in school. They're not actually teaching literacy. They're probably teaching reading or spelling or phonics or comprehension. And from learning those things, people develop their literacy. And it doesn't stop, does it, when we leave school? I'm sure when you started working in politics and on the council, you were developing your literacy skills when you came across a whole new bunch of terminology and new, to, and new language that you had to get your head around. So that literacy journey carries on through life. Same with physical literacy. And the reason I love it is because it recognises that we all have a part to play. So as a parent or a grandparent, or a friend, if you have children, young young children, grandchildren, you play a role with them at home. If you're a teacher in school, you have a role to play in terms of their physical development and physical education. If you're a coach in the community, you also have a role. All those roles might be slightly different, but they all support that physical literacy journey. And physical literacy is about really understanding how much movement is part of who we are as a species. So. If we get the physical literacy piece right and we support it with good sport, good education, good play and movement experiences, what we see is young young adults becoming passionate about movement. And that might be in community sport that might be in recreation and leisure or climbing or surfing. It could be anything it might. But it should lead to a life of engagement in some form of physical activity. Uh, and I think that's a really, really wonderful thing and, and brilliant that we all have a role to play. So that's that's why I, I think it's so important. And also that whole point that this is developmental. Uh, and what we mean by that in this context is we can't think about one part of that journey without recognizing that that fits into a whole long process. So an example, we, we were doing some work with the FAW and I had to go up and do some work with them on, uh, as, as a project. And Oshin Roberts said to me, oh, they said, oh, well, you get these seven year old children, they come to us and they can't kick a ball and then they don't want to play football and they leave the club. And that's not we need to think about, OK, so what's gone on before that seven year old has started playing football and what's going to be a consequence of that child not getting the skills they need in terms of them as a lifelong physical activity? So we can't think of anything in isolation. We have to think about that whole lifelong process. Uh, and that process starts very much with laying the foundations in early childhood, which is where a lot of our work fits. Uh, and we often hear a lot about physical literacy in, in the early years, but we, we must think about physical literacy as a lifelong thing, but starting with strong foundations in early childhood. Uh, the problem we've got is that children are not actually moving as much as they used to. So all of the multi-billion pound industry that is baby gadgets and gears, it, it is all around making life easier for busy parents. Uh, but what it does is it traps children into contraptions and stops them having vital movement experiences. We got lots of driving kids back and forth to school. We've got mums sitting in coffee shops and dads drinking coffee. Nothing wrong with that. Only if you've got a child strapped in a buggy for many hours as a result of it. Uh, as we've heard from some of our parents, actually, in, in some of the head teachers in some of the Swansea schools were te first time I heard about it was one saying to us, oh, I'm really worried. We've got Mum's dropping the, the youngsters off to nursery in the morning with a with a little baby in a pushchair. They meet at the gate, they go and get a coffee, they sit and have their coffee, they give the baby a screen, they come back to pick up the other one at lunchtime, and that little one, tiny one, has been in that pushchair all morning. And it's like, oh my goodness. But that mum doesn't know, unless someone's told her that your 
you're stopping your child's development, you're hindering that child's development by strapping them into a buggy. They just think they're having a nice coffee with their friends and the child is happy. So, you know, it's I'm not blaming anyone, but I'm just saying this is a change in society. And, you know, we're up against a whole industry that wants young people to be engaged with their screens and their PlayStations, their TV programs. Uh, what What's resulting is maybe a lack of physical activity. I talk about it as a perfect storm of inactivity that we're facing but it actually is a real problem uh, we need to get young children to be moving and, and it's not just about physical activity but also about the quality of the movement and the reason I say that is because if we actually look at what's going on in that very early part of life young babies moving loads and loads and reaching grabbing crawling climbing hanging swinging they're actually not just laying those physical foundations, which they are, but they're also laying foundations in their brain. So every time a young baby reaches, grabs something, is stimulated, they're laying pathways in their brain. And the first seven years of a baby's life is absolutely crucial for building these neural pathways. And that's what play is all about. So play for young children is all about building pathways in the brain through stimulus, all of those traditional things we'd have done, like nursery rhymes, clapping songs, moving, all of that is stimulating the brain and laying pathways. And if we don't get all of that as a lovely, rich, and it's, it happens through physical interaction and play, if we don't get all of that right in early childhood, then children have problems with speech and language, with processing information, with higher order cognitive thinking later, which is needed for skills like reading and mathematical um, study at school. So those very early play opportunities are not just about the physicality. And a really important thing, any of you that have I've got children, grandchildren that are young, you'll know that they love to swing and hang and climb and be upside down and spin about. That is about us getting used to our balance system. So the reason I got a picture of an ear up on my on my screen here is because the inside our inner ear, some of you may be aware of it, is our, what we call our vestibular system. It's our balance system. It's a really ancient system in us as a species. And actually, right from the minute we hold a newborn baby on, on our shoulder to wind it, and it tries to hold its head up just for a fraction of a second, it's begin, the baby is beginning to get its relationship with gravity. Because that system in our ear tells us where we are in relation to gravity. And this picture of this young baby starting to learn to stand and walk is a baby learning to manage all of their muscles and joints in relation to gravity by falling a little bit forward and then balancing by taking a step. Falling a bit forward, balancing, taking a step. It's a hugely complex thing that the body has to do, which is why it takes basically a whole year to do it. And and it actually relates to everything that happens developmentally in terms of that whole development. So an example of this is really important in young babies is a baby needs to learn to hold their head. So they, that relationship with gravity to have eye contact so that we can start to get those relationships when we when we do all that lovely baby talk, don't we, to a baby and we go, hello, and we make funny noises and the baby responds to us because we're doing all that and they follow us around. And what they're doing is they're learning about nonverbal communication. So they're learning about facial expression, intonation, the patterns of language, the rhythm of sound. They, and they need to have stability of their head to do that. So stability underpins everything. So all of that lovely play and rich movement that children are getting less and less and less of because society is giving us so many gadgets and we're all so busy. Actually, that play and that movement is critical for children's lovely development. It's also really important because it, that stability lays the foundations for physical activity. And I've got here like a, a mountain range. It's talked about in all of the um, literature in motor development. They call it the motor development mountain. But what it means is that we have what they call a base camp that runs across the bottom there of, of, of motor skills. And if we don't have a nice big base camp along the bottom here, then we can't choose to go up different mountain ranges and peaks of physical activity or sport. So, for example, in, in Wales, of course, we have our famous rugby players. So Shane Williams would have had his lovely big base camp of skills here. He would have put that into sport. He'd have put it into rugby and played it at a really high level. So had a really high mountain peak. But he also had other physical activities and sports he did. He was good across the board at a range of things so that when he retired from his rugby career he's able to carry on being physically active 
because he's got this big base camp of skills. And that's really, really important because if we're going to have that long development, that long lifelong journey, we need to have a big base camp of lots of skills. In, in, in our language development, we talk about having a lovely big vocabulary so that we can talk about things. And in, in our field, we talk about a movement vocabulary so that we can enter loads of different physical activities, have a choice of sports because we have those foundations and movements to give us the choice. From a health point of view, this is the most researched developmental model in the world. I'm not going to even attempt to explain all of it to you because it basically the people that wrote it are colleagues of ours from the States primarily and across the world. And they they admit that it looks like they had too much red wine and Scott scribbling with black and red pens. But this this model shows us that if we don't get movement right in early years, what you get is these two different spirals for young people. Um, and we're very familiar with some of these spirals. You either get children that get a positive experience, they have the skills, they want to move, and they enter this lovely positive upward spiral where they engage in physical activity, they get better at the skills, they choose to do more, and they tend to have a healthy weight and be have a good positive health trajectory. If we don't get it right in early years, and that might mean that children are busy, strapped, uh, too much strapped in buggies, they don't go out to play, they don't have the experiences, we can't plug the gaps in schools, they don't think they can move, they don't want to move, they enter this downward spiral. And what we're seeing is a high number of young children becoming inactive, feeling they can't access physical activity, not wanting to, being overweight, becoming obese, and there's a whole range of these diseases, non-communicable diseases that go with sedentary behaviour. Um, and we're starting to see it, aren't we, with type 2 diabetes in primary school children, which is absolutely shocking. So um, this is the health, this is a model that kind of predicts that. I'm just going to pick out one tiny bit from it because the, there's two little bits that are really important in terms of our work. One is that the bit I showed you earlier, those babies being super active. So the more we get children being really active in rich, lovely play, that will make them competent. So in very young babies, how much they move and the quality of that movement will drive whether they become a competent mover. But as they get older, how competent, how good they are moving will drive whether they choose to be physically active. For us, the good news is that there's this bit from the psychology that makes it a bit more complicated. So in psychology, they tell us that we're, that we ha all of us perceive ourselves, we think we're good at stuff or not, pretty much. And if we think we're rubbish at stuff, we tend to maybe avoid it and go, oh, I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, and we tend to opt into things that we feel that we're pretty good at. And the good news for us is that for children under the age of about seven or eight, they are cognitively, they haven't reached a level where they know whether they're good or not. And so they think if we praise them and they try hard, they think they're amazing. We see this in early years classrooms and preschools. If you went and said, who wants to show me a lovely st a star shape? They'd all be like, me, me, because they all think they're great. Even if they can't do it, they all think they're brilliant. So this is a magic window for us. This is a window of opportunity when we need to get these children to be competent movers, because this is the foundations that we need to lay for them to be able to choose activity. We're not talking about them being skilled in sport skills. We're talking about that big movement vocabulary that lays foundations so that we need them to be able to be a competent at catching, at throwing, at kicking, but not in a way that's related to a specific sport, just being able to catch and throw and kick and run and hop and skip and jump. So they feel before they hit that age of seven or eight, when they look around and go, oh, am I actually any good at this? They need to feel that they're a mover before they hit that window. So our work is all really um that we've been doing with the Swansea team is in this early years window. Uh, and if you've got any doubts about investing in the early years, <laughs> this is a really quite famous study called High Scope Perry Preschool Study from the States. And interestingly, High Scope was one of the co uh, global curriculum that influenced the foundation phase here in Wales. High Scope was a really high quality early years curriculum that they invested in in a region of, of the of the states and at the same time they did an amazing study where they did a, actually a, a randomized control of spreading children into different classes some that got the high scope which was more expensive investment because it was really high quality early years curriculum and those that didn't and they were all from the same socioeconomic background but they were randomized into different classes and then they tracked them from the age of three to the age of 41 and they costed it in terms of where those people were, how many of them had been involved with criminal justice systems, education support, welfare, 
who owned houses, who'd been to university, who paid more taxes. And the return on the money that they invested in that high scope was 716% because of what it saved in the cost for people that didn't do as well if they didn't have that curriculum. So we know that this early years is an absolutely incredible time to invest. You know, and in this in this um, study, they didn't even factor in health costs. So I think if we, when we look at that trajectory, so our work is all in the early years. We do a program called Skip Cymru. It came from research that looked at our amazing foundation phase in Wales, which is play-based, which is brilliant. And we looked at schools that were doing really good foundation phase work and we looked at, okay, so what's happening with the children's skills, their physical competence in this lovely play-in environment? And we were really, really shocked because what we found was that children were developing some of their skills, what we call locomotor, their run, jump, hop type skills, but they weren't developing their object control skills. And you might go, oh, well, it's not a problem. They might just be a mountain climber, never play a sport. But actually, the object control skills in all the research from across the world, they tell us that if, it, if they've got good object control skills in their early childhood, it predicts how active they are as an adolescent. So it, these skills are really important in terms of showing whether they're going to go into that upward spiral or the downward spiral. The other important piece about those skills is they're a type of skill that, that won't just develop through playing alone. So locomotor skills kind of will, because as a species, all humans, wherever you are, need to travel from A to B to get water, food, etc. But throwing, catching, kicking, they're kind of to do with our culture and we need to be taught them. So unless teachers know how to teach these skills, these children will not just develop them. And it would be like me saying, OK, well, I'm just going to tip a bag of letters on the classroom floor and let the children play with the letters and eventually they'll learn to read. And we know that would be nonsense. We know that won't happen. And I think we didn't realize this about our children needing to know these skills. The motor development research shows us this, but we didn't understand it as a society. Because I think many, many years ago, you think about like in my childhood and before, children were out playing for hours and hours, but not just playing with their class and their age group, with all the older kids in the neighborhood, with your cousins, with your, you know, with your neighbor's cousins. And you had these older kids, if you'd be playing and you'd be kicking the ball, one of the older kids would go, no, 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 don't kick it like this, put it here. So they, you don't have to be taught by teachers, you would have been taught culturally through a hand-me-down knowledge. Now, children aren't doing that anymore at all. And what we realised when we did our research was, oh my goodness, we've got teachers that don't know how to teach these skills and children that aren't getting them anywhere else. So we work with a colleague, Jackie Goodway from the States, and she's in one of these pictures working with the students. She actually was one of the people that drew that spidery diagram of a model and and Jackie's a professor of motor development in Ohio State University and she developed the, the SKIP program which stands for successful kinesthetic instruction for preschoolers which is why we call it SKIP and her background is areas of extreme deprivation where we will see every child is pretty much going to have a delay in their motor skills we know that that's not just a Welsh statistic that's global so if you've got areas of deprivation, children will be delayed in their motor skills. So over 30 years of Jackie's work has been taking her doctoral, her PhD students out into areas of deprivation and putting in programs that can try and lift these children out of delays with their motor skills. So we worked with Jackie and we said, OK, what are the principles of that and how can we build that into our play based curriculum here in Wales and it not be delivered by PhD students because we don't have enough. We actually need teachers, practitioners, coaches to be able to do this. So we've worked with Jackie for about six years now and we've done lots of research on it and we have a program and we've had, we did get a doctoral student funded by Europe for three or four years and, and we've run different versions of it and we've now come up where we have some accredited modules and we go in and we train preschools with a level three module and it's blended. So a lot of it is online. So they get the content online with lots of animations and interactive resources. And so the knowledge can be delivered really flexibly online. And then we go in and we do some workshops with them in a flexible way, two lots of workshops that can fit in around the preschool staff's times, maybe Saturdays, maybe evenings uh, and the preschool staff. And we and we run that in preschools that feed into our foundation phase setting. So an example of this is in St. Thomas is actually in Swansea, where all of the preschools have done the level three, the staff, and we've trained all the level four the, the foundation phase teachers in the school with the level four, which is, again, a lot of online work, but we have more workshops where the teachers need to be planning to teach this to a whole class of children. So they teach them, we, we go through all the skills. So they have um, 
what we call an action research. They have to put some practice in, they have to reflect on it. It's quite a high level of assessment. But we really need that to embed this and change. These teachers have had very little training of this in their initial teacher education, which we're trying to work to address uh, with our BA Ed students at the moment. So they're coming out of, of university. They don't know how to teach these skills. So we, we're giving them the plugging this little gap in our foundation phase. So that's, that's some of it. When we've tested it with our evidence and we have published peer reviewed journals that show that this works. And brilliantly, the Health and Social Care uh, and Sport Committee did a call for evidence back in 2018, 2019, and they took all the evidence on this. And they um, it's a recommendation in there that all physical, uh, foundation phase children in Wales should have motor programs like Skip Cymru, and they would support the rollout of Skip Cymru across the whole of Wales. It's a case study in the journey to a healthier Wales, Wellbeing of Future Generations Act um, support materials as a professional development case study. Um, now, Welsh Government haven't acted on that March 2019 recommendation. They accepted it, but then we had that strange little thing called a pandemic arrive, I guess. So, um, But actually, last Friday, the Health Minister did come down to see our Skip Cymru work. So... Um, We've, uh, I, I'm a bit cheeky, so I asked her for some money, but whether I'll get it, I don't know. I, the vice chancellor's face was a bit of a shock when I asked her, but hey, you don't ask, you don't get. So um, that's where we are with it. And I just think that right now, post COVID, we need this work more than ever with our children. And that's me. So sorry about that. If uh, I might, did I go over time, Mike? I hope don't, not. Don't, don't apologize, now. That, that, that was really insightful. Um, we, we're gonna move on to, um, Dave's uh, report now and before we move on can I ask whether any committee members have burning questions that they want to ask now that at this stage or shall we move on we can always come back after doing Dave and after Dave's presentation are we content okay okay lovely so we move on to the next uh, session now. Thank you very much for that Nalda. I mean it really did shine some very powerful lights for me. I made lots of notes here and I hand over to David Jones. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank, thanks, Councillor Dirk. My neck is a little sore from nodding in agreement with Nalda from for the last 20 minutes, so you'll have to forgive me about that. Um, and just, just briefly before I go into a little bit of an introduction to the report, um, as Nalda said at the start, we've been committed to the uh, physical literacy programme in Swansea for quite some time. And if I'm totally honest, if I, if I were to ask my active young people's team, what do they enjoy doing as much as anything else? The physical literacy delivery would come very high on the top of the list because they can see the difference it makes during the periods that they were within schools. That, that you can physically see the changes it makes to the to the children, not just in their physical development, but in their confidence and in their ability to do other things. It totally transcends a lot of the activities that we do. So they love it. And <laughs> I must say, I do feel a little bit uh, underqualified because I've written about physical literacy in the report that you have in front of you, not knowing that Nalda was coming to start with. But what I will say, my colleague Helen Cadogan, who um, Nalda will know quite well, gave me most of the information for that. She has a master's degree in this in this area and was actually tutored by Nalda. So the so so the delivery that we do at Swansea comes directly from source. We 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 are kind of guinea pigs I suppose in a way but very willing ones in terms of the delivery of physical literacy as you'll see that's that that was part of the report that I wrote I'm not going to go into that now <laughs> I think that's I think that's probably been done far better than I would ever do it um, but just in in terms of a bit of an overview of the of the sport and health service um, we we have a, an operational strategy which um, I've asked to attach as an appendix to the report called creating an active Swansea Basically, that's an operational strategy which looks at um, what we do across the board. We try to deliver to the entire community, um, regardless of age, regardless of ability. But what I've what I've done in the in, in the in, in the in the committee report is try to concentrate on the things that are most relevant to education. Um, probably the. The, the part of our team that you will recognise most from an educational setting will be the active young people team. They've been operational. Every every local authority has an active young people team. They they, they qualify. Uh, they're funded by Sport Wales. 
Um, we are given uh, lots of flexibility in terms of how we deliver the Active Young People programmes because each local authority is very different from the next. Um, but uh, fundamentally, we're about creating opportunities for participation for young people and improving the standards of, of, of existing participation and making the whole experience of being physically active as pleasant as possible and as accessible as possible for young people. You may remember some of the, the, the guises of the active young people team, what it used to be called, Dragon Sport, 5 times 60 A lot of people still refer to them as that, but we've been, it's been active young people across Wales now for a number of years. Um, primarily, in terms of the, the role of the active young people team, we are there to support curriculum activities rather than deliver them and uh, enhance uh, the, the PE curriculum uh, in both primary and secondary, as well as through the physical literacy things that we do to prepare young people physically for school through um, through physical activity sessions. So when they come to school, they, 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 they are hopefully more physically able and coordinated to be able to get the best that they possibly can and, and in, in terms of that early start. Um, so as well as that curricular as well as that curricular curricular enhancement, we look to provide opportunities around the curricula um, to uh, motivate and engage young people in sport and physical activity with a view to um, linking them with community opportunities because for us it's not just about them being physically active whilst they're in school. One of our objectives, which is one of our strap lines on our, on, on our, um, on our strategy, is for Swansea to be one of the healthiest and most physically active cities in the UK where people participate for life. Now, it's critical, following on from what Nanda was saying, and um, with the experiences young people have in school for sport, physical activity and physical well-being, that those experiences are, are positive. Because although schools at that age are probably the best and most likely point where young people will engage in sport, a positive a positive experience will, will potentially engage them for life and a negative experience will do the complete opposite. So it's, it's hugely important that, um, that, that the, the activities that young people have on offer during those ages are, are positive and, and progressional and, and gives them somewhere to go um, in exit from school in communities. And, 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 and as I say, in terms of lifelong participation, where we find um, we're often a little bit more helpful in schools than others in primary settings obviously in in in, in um, secondary settings there are there are experts in, on the PE curriculum there are specialist teachers we don't we, we really other than working with PE teachers to to um, work out what the young people would like to do outside of the curriculum we, we kind of leave it there because there, there are experts in the field that isn't always the case unfortunately in primary schools through no fault of their own Often teachers training when it comes to teacher training settings, there's often a little bit of a neglect for the for the for the PE curriculum, and a lot of people that do primary school training go in go into go into primary schools with hours, literally just hours um, of training within sport and physical activity. Other schools have PE have, have PE. Uh, uh, Curriculum. So the other primary schools have curriculum advisors that are extremely qualified and extremely um, experienced, but it, it tends to be uh, a little bit hap, uh, slapdash in terms of how that would happen. So we tend to give a lot more support to the the the, the, the PE curriculum advisors within the, the the primaries than we do within the secondaries. All in all, we tend we tend to target groups with certain characteristics based on national uh, surveys carried out by Sport Wales and Public Health Wales where we look at average participation rates in various activities and the capacities of young children and young adults uh, at various activities and we target groups that have lower than average participation rates and lower than average capacities and abilities so that is often areas of um, economic deprivation, um, people with disabilities, the 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 um, BAME communities, and often sometimes uh, women and girls female participation is slightly lower than that of of male participation. So they would tend to be our target groups, where we would put more resources than others. Um, 
we we'd like to think that the work we do with schools not only supports some of the things that Nalda was talking about, but also can affect and influence school attainment, definitely school attendance, and often the behaviour of young people in schools too. We can give you numerous examples of of teachers coming teachers uh, coming back to us and telling us that young people that we've dealt with in extracurricular activities over a number of weeks have had a bit of an attitude adjustment in terms of their behavior in school and, and, they, and their outlook on things because they've been engaged with a, with some with, with an activity at that school and regardless of whether it was from the teachers or teaching staff they still associate it with school even though it's potentially extracurricular so it's a, a, a real positive um, a, a real positive activity that young people will associate with school. An example of that is right at the very bottom of um, of the report that you've been given in terms of uh, a questionnaire that we saw coming back from a project that we run called SHEP, which was the school holiday enrichment program. That, that was a project that was aimed at schools with very high rates of free school meals. So there's some of the most deprived schools in town and it was looking at <clears throat> um, providing that providing activities during the summer holidays and advice on nutrition so it was partly nutrition what's good to eat what's not what's not good to eat with, without lecturing too much do you really need that fizzy drink do you think it might be a better idea to have some to, to, have, a, to have a drink of water do you really need that chocolate try this piece of fruit etc etc but with physical activity alongside it as well um, I think you I don't know whether you would have noticed right right at the at the bottom of that um, of that report, there were some questions to, to the young people about their attitudes towards various parts of their lifestyles before and after participating in the SHEP activities. And you know, without going into too much detail, some of the things that struck me wasn't just the fact that they enjoyed that their activities. Great. My team delivered some of that, so I'm glad they enjoyed it. We we're along the right lines. But it struck me that some of them were going back and having better relationships with their with their whole families, having participated in sport. And it enhanced their enjoyment of their entire school holi school holidays because it gave them ideas of other things to do. And interestingly as well, it, it made a very high percentage of them look forward to going back to school in September more than they would have beforehand. So it's just, it's, you know, it, being physically active is important, but this those kind of knock on things that, um, that, that go alongside it as well that uh, we feel are of benefit too. Um, in terms of, where we're moving forward to this fundamentally as 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 i kind of said our fund our, our fundamental role is about in, increasing participation and improving standards building capacity for um more people to be more active more often um but we are looking now in terms of our partnership with sport wales um looking at more projects that give us more insight and learning into behaviors of not just young people but if, in terms of your concern, young people of school school age, in terms of um, their attitudes towards uh, th th their health, their well-being moving forward, how their how their local environments can influence how they feel about those things, how likely they would be to participate, how important they think leading healthy healthy lifestyles are, and how much wh where they live, wh where they're brought up their peers, the, the opportunities that they have within their communities, how much all that influences their outlook on, on, on those things. Um, just, to, just to finish off, really, we are see ourselves, I suppose, within the, within the field of sport, physical activity and physical well-being as a bit of a, a conduit between the local authority and the rest of the industry, not just locally, but nationally, I suppose. So in one way, we would look at how council services can benefit members of the community in terms of making them physically more physically active. For example, access to facilities that the local authority have that may or not may or may not be available for sport and physical activity. In terms of the um, uh, access to facilities and facilities that we may not have thought of as being appropriate for physical activity, but actually are. So there's. The, the use of schools after after hours, which I, I, I know is, is is quite a hot topic with Welsh Government at the moment. And conversely, and now that is probably a good example of that, looking at how we can use our sport and physical, physical activity network to bring 
opportunities to the people of Swansea and to functions of Swansea Council too. We weren't instructed by Swansea Council to work with NALDA. It, it came because of the networks that we work in. And, as, and, and the result of it is has benefited schools in Swansea and benefited children's place key, uh, children's care settings in Swansea as well. So we are we see ourselves as we're not exactly experts in anything, if I'm if I'm perfectly honest, but we see ourselves in a position where we are kind of central to a lot of agencies and a lot of areas of work that can bring in a lot of expertise in the field of sport and physical activity. And we 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 kind of put ourselves in a position where we would get those resources working as best as they can for people in Swansea. And obviously you've, you've got the report in front of you and probably more importantly in the, in the wider context, the, the, create, the creating an active Swansea document, which is more of, an, more of an overarching document, but I'm sure you'll be able to pick out the parts that are, that are, that are most relevant to school settings and education. Thank you very much, Dave. That, that's yeah, fabulous. I mean, I've gone through the report uh, in some detail and uh, including the last page. So if uh, it, it committee colleagues haven't picked it up, it's the last page of the report. There's a table on the last page of the report. I think it's page 20. Um, hang on a second, page 21. And uh, there's lots of powerful aspects to this report. But the, the evidence from that table is really incredible, I think. And uh, in the context of, as you say, I think it was three quarters of children who responded said they fe felt closer to their parents or family as a result of being engaged with the summer activity programme. It's, it's incredible. Can I ask committee members for questions, please? Linda. More comment actually. First, I thought the, yeah. the uh, report or the, the evidence that uh, Nalda gave was quite fascinating actually. Uh, it really was. And I know on this committee we've talked about, uh, you know, the need for sport and we've also mentioned music, so non-academic subjects to get people really involved. And David, the work that you're doing there, uh, you know, it, it's quite clear it's getting people into school and they probably wouldn't have attended otherwise. They'd slip out of it. So I think I found the, you know, both both reports really fascinating and, and thank you. So not so much a question, but uh, a comment really, uh, Mike. Thank you, Lyndon. It, it's quite interesting that we had a bit of a preamble as the meeting was beginning and we were talking about experience of school a very long time ago. And some of those links with the old days, getting out and about, I mean, being kicked out by your mum when it's in the morning and being told to come home when it's dark and tea time, you know, that was this. <laughs> I'm talking, of course, about older members of the committee. Not the <laughs> one. But, uh, but that is interesting. I never thought about what we lost from those uh, those activities that perhaps we took for granted. Can I ask Councillor Thomas, Des? You were yes. a bit of just then, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I was, yeah, I was thinking of myself, you... Jan. I was thinking of myself, Jan. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the older members of the committee. Yeah, yeah. The, um, yes, many of those comments r rung bells, and um, you know, playing with um, neighbours, cousins, and all that sort of thing that you uh, that remain friends for the rest of your lives, and and that experience you get to know other people, you get um, experiences which you wouldn't normally get. Um, uh, and again, I'm not sure so, so many, um, not so much of a question, but, but a comment. Um, I've got a son who's a primary head, uh, primary school head teacher, and he swears by um, the, the sport and play for, for, for primary children. They, they learn so much. And indeed, I've got a, a granddaughter who's doing an MA in, um, in, in play education, learning through play. And um, so... Perhaps um, what, what's I know we we're talking about sport uh, uh, other than play. Um, there's not a great difference, is there? Um, I suppose at the younger age you begin by playing, and you and then you sort of develop some of your play skills in, into a sport. Um, so a fa fascinating reports from both um, um, deliverers, and uh, I will say, chair. Um, 
Nalda lived up to your 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 build up. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just respond there second, Mike? It's just, um, yeah, what you say is really important, that link between play and sport is that play is absolutely crucial for laying those movement foundations. But the shock that we felt, what we, we weren't aware of was that children weren't getting all of the foundational skills they needed just through play and that we needed to plug that gap by training practitioners to teach motor skills that years ago they would have learned by being out with different multiple generations. So you know, and, and we've got quite a lot of data of children just testing their motor skills. And what we're seeing is that pretty much the vast majority of children have got delay in those physical skills now, not just those children in areas of deprivation, which is, is really shocking. And it explains why we're seeing this rise in children with overweight and obesity and poor physical activity rates in society. So, you know, that's that's why we think this is so that's why I'm so passionate and I bang on about it all the time is we have to train all of all of our practitioners and adults that work with young and you know a lot of our work is about also the same message you know if we could talk to the people the health professionals around GP clusters because the message has to come to parents right from the start about how important this is and it, it's got to be a consistent message from everyone that's interacting with those families about getting children away from screens and making sure they're out playing and moving in that lovely, rich way. Yeah, thank you. It was interesting to the economic um, relevance of, um, you know, of, of uh, tackling it at an early age, um, mm -hmm. the the and the economic cost to society over half the lifetime anyway, you know, 40, 40 years, I think the span was, wasn't it? 41 years. So it's, uh, that's, yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Could I just add to that, that um, we did have a meet and some of uh, my colleagues would remember the China Family Social Services meeting where two heads of service compared uh, the same case. And one future pathway for the case would be heavy end intervention and the, as the um, projected costs compared with um, taking a community networking approach and encouraging the people in the family to get involved with the community. And, the co and, and we could dig this out, I'm sure, for, for education and skills colleagues, but the cost savings were absolutely dramatic and the impact on, it was a dad with three children who was really struggling the impact on the dad was absolutely transformational, but the cost to public services was minimal. That's it's a real return on investment, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Who made the comment about it being a village to bring up a child? Well, thank you very thank much, you, Chair. Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Mike. <laughs> thank you. Um, can we go to Jan Curtis, please? Yeah. Can I thank uh, Nalder and David for the presentation? It was really uh, eye-opening, to be honest with you. Um, it's one thing that bugs me when I see a mum pushing a baby in a pram with, with, with an electronic device in front of them. You know, where where is the talking for a start gone to children? I, I'm lucky enough to be a governor of a school where the children do a, most of their education out of doors. They're outdoor learning, they, they plant in gardens, they bike, you know, cycling, they're doing lots of things. So I, I just can't state enough how important outdoor activities and exercise and sport and everything. I love sport at school. I think that was my favourite subject. I hated all the learning part of it. I loved the PE side of it and netball. But I think it's so important. Not everybody is academic, and I think it's really important that we encourage our children in lots of other ways other than, than academic subjects. But thank you both. It was really eye-opening. And as I said, it's one of my bugbears when I see kids I think they're the worst and the best of things that ever got invented. But thanks, Mike. Thank you, Jan. Hannah Lawson. Thanks, Mike. Yes, uh, I'd like to add my thanks to Nalda and David for really excellent presentations, really fascinating. Um, I'm actually the complete opposite of Jan in that I detested sports in school, oh. absolutely <laughs> detested it with a passion. I would have sat there and done any other subject for two hours rather than five minutes of sports. I hated it. Um, as an adult, however, I've, I'm very active. You know, I do things like martial arts and swimming and, you know, a huge range of activities. Um, and I just really, I suppose my my reflection of my experiences is how do we 
how do we connect earlier with those children who are like me and who don't like your kind of traditional netball, hockey, rounders kind of things that they just weren't for me, you know? And I'm sure a lot of kids feel like that. And, um, you know, there. I think that maybe there are other things linked into those sorts of experiences as well. Uh, perhaps things like, um, you know, young women, I think, tend to suffer a little bit more self-consciousness, a bit more body consciousness, those kinds of aspects. And um, uh, something that I've done a lot as an adult as well is um, to do with music, you know, whether it's dancing, whether it's to do with taiko drumming, which is really, really, really physical. And I think that it's interesting that somebody um, compa has already compared music and sport in the same breath, because to me, they're very, very much linked as well. And I was wondering whether there's some kind of, uh, some something that we can explore there to help children that maybe aren't quite so much your hockey and netball kind of kids into doing something that's maybe a little bit more suited to them. Do you want me to jump in, Mike, or? Yes, if you would, I, Nala, please. Yeah, just to say, Hannah, thank you for the, 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 the comment. It's, um, it might shock you to know that actually the physical education curriculum does not include hockey rounders, netball, rugby, football, cricket. <laughs> now I'm showing my age, you see. <laughs> it's, um, you wouldn't think it because that's what you see taught in, in the majority of schools, but that's down to a physical education teachers that come at it from only a sport perspective because actually outdoor and adventurous activities, creative activities are equally within the curriculum and should be being delivered. So one of, another one of my bugbears is that actually physical education teachers should be delivering the curriculum and that the more we support that foundation of movement, you know, that's why a broad movement vocabulary is really important and not specialising children in sport, you know, because if we give children that broad foundation of movement, then they can choose a whole multitude of, of routes and and you know for me a really good practice is where you see schools linking with community and a school can bring in what's around them on their doorstep and I'm sure you know David with, with their team will be doing a lot of this and you bring in sampling for children of what's available so if they're not into being in a school team it's like oh yeah but we had that somebody from taekwondo come in and you know the school and I can go there and I can do it and you build those links around a school like your village that's raising your child in a variety of things. That's excellent thanks Nanda. Can I can I go to David first and then to uh, Councillor Gordon? Actually just kind of um, on, on top of what Nalda would just say and then I totally get what you're saying about the young people that would you see taking part in, in rugby football and your traditional sports they are not our target group. They, they, we consider them to be catered for. We would help community clubs in those sports build their capacity, but our resources would go into those kids that are not engaged with that. So we would have a practice sometimes of deliberately putting one of our after school activities on at the same time as the PE teacher is doing after school rugby. So those kids can't come. So basically those otherwise you just have the same young people come into everything and dominated all, dominated all, all the activities. So we would deliberately clash with the rugby team, the football team, the netball team, because we consider them to be already in our system. We've got them. It's the ones that uh, are not necessarily engaged in those activities that would be our our target audience. And a lot of the the activities that we put on Given, the, given that it has to be safe and it has to be within the expertise of my team, would come from the, the, the young people themselves. So we would ask them what they would like to do, what's missing, with an eye on what's available in their communities too, because we wouldn't necessarily want to engage them in something that they'll never ever do or see again. So there is things, as, as Nalda was um, getting at, you know, Swansea is unbelievably um, lucky in terms of things like outdoor activities water-based activities, we would engage young people in those with partners in the community to allow them to carry on doing that post-school. So that that's how we would help devise a programme of, of engagement. 
Th- thank you, Dave. Uh, can I go to Fiona Gordon? And Fiona, I've got to offer you a, a slight apology, really, but it is still on the agenda because I remember you, that you flagged about door education specifically in the previous committee meeting. And that's something that we, we will, of course, follow up on again uh, based on what we've heard, learned today. So over to Fiona, please. Oh, thanks. Um, and yeah, um, a couple of things. Sorry to have missed the beginning. So you might have already answered my questions. I was also going to touch on what Hannah's asked about, about engaging uh, more reluctant, uh, you know, sort of uh, learners as, as as I was one myself. But you've answered that. Thank you, Nalda and David. Um, I just, yeah, I was going to mention because I work in ALN in Carmarthenshire, so I'm aware of yeah, the, the, the significant concerns we've got about young people and, and their physical health, which is linked to their mental health. Um, so I was going to ask whether we have um, tapped into a possibility that's uh, a training that's available from uh, Trinity, which is called SKIP, mm. which is about developing quality um, quality physical movement in the early years. And it's about training foundation phase uh, teams to, to be able to carry that forward um, and also I just wondered about um, yeah um, I know that Kamarth and Sheriff recently appointed an outdoor learning uh, coordinator to, to look at you know the possibilities there and develop young people moving uh, outside and so on so yeah it's those things really. Well, well straight straight back to Nalda you'd be very interested in the report that Nalda will send us um, after the meeting. Right. Thanks. Without repeating what you said earlier, and Alda, could you give her a little answer, please? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Fiona. Um, yeah, that skip is what I was presenting about. It's what um, we're doing quite a lot in Swansea. So Mike asked me to come and talk about the Skip Cymru programme and how it can roll out. And we are actually doing a lot of work with Carmarthen local authority as well. Now they're setting up some stuff. So. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, we're banging that drum everywhere, far and wide. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I think for, from my point of view, uh, it, it's fascinating to uh, see the links. Dave said, we're not an expert in anything, uh, but what you are an expert in, and this is a clear example of best practice for me, this is about collaboration and coordination. People pooling their resources and pulling in the same direction. And I, I'm really, really impressed with that along with the very strong focus that we've got to see in physical literacy, health and sport as a as a central plank in the education skills development for all children and young people, regardless of, of their aptitudes, regardless of their backgrounds, of how supportive or otherwise they might, um, their home environment might be. And I think that's really um, exciting. My my last comment for me would be that when we've looked at a lot of data in this committee this year, we've seen the, the brilliance of people like Mike Jones in education and lots of other colleagues I know. And it doesn't it seem that we're looking at the same issues from different perspectives and coming together with a very positive sense of what the issues are and um, a, a very positive light being shone on some of the excellent work that is going on which is transforming and, and improving the lives of our most vulnerable children in schools in Swansea and for me it's what we do next is the key question how do we galvanize how do we take on board committee members questions today and say well look how can we really pull this together and do more what of what experts in the field know uh, has a, such a dramatic effect and impact on children and young people can I ask a uh, cabinet member, Robert Smith? Can, Robert, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I, I think we, you know, we've, we've had two very, fa you know, fascinating presentations this afternoon, um, and, and certainly, you know, th this is a way uh, offers some uh, indications of, of some ways that the committee can move forward, and we as a council can move forward. So, you know, really uh, impressed by. Uh, uh, by the presentations and look forward to mulling over uh, where this is going to take us, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. So on that point, um, there's no other hands, nobody's indicating. Um, we can move on uh, on to the work plan for the remainder of the year. Can I, now dates are very important for us at this point because we're heading towards an election. <clears> so I think that um, as we are, my screen has just gone off on its own. That's not a good thing to do. 
and um, we're looking at um, our next meeting on the 16th of February, then we've got one penciled in for the 16th of March, but am I right in saying that we're okay to go ahead with the 16th of March meeting? Yeah, that's fine, Gemma. Yeah, that's okay. So, um, bearing in mind that we've had previous discussion about ed outdoor education, next time we're going to look at adverse childhood experiences with support from colleagues from Park New Um uh, Is the committee content to move forward on that basis? So is there anything else we'd like to add in for the last few uh, meetings for this municipal year? Okay. Nodding heads. Yep. Lovely. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, can I thank very much indeed Nalda for uh, coming in and introducing what was an excellent presentation and built upon then by Dave's brilliant insights as the Council of Sport and Health Manager. Um, and I feel really heartened by the activities that we see in. And I do spend a lot of my time in different sport in parks and playgrounds, etc. I'm a member of Anastawi Cricket Club. It's by Mumbles, Ponte de Lais. We ride across Swansea, you know, I'm out and about quite a lot, particularly in the summer. And what, what, what resonates with me is the fact that these great community facilities provide all sorts of activities, including music, including dance, including, um, you know, the, the you know, elite sporting opportunities and everything that goes with it, all community life is to be found in one of the sports grounds that we have dotted across the city. And my final point would be the interesting area that Dave picked up on when we're looking at looking at local authority facilities that could be better utilised to, to expand the foundation of activity. What occurred to me was our community centres are a great resource across the city and county area, and, and lots of them have got sports halls. Um, how often are they used? I know, you know there's lots of great activities run by volunteers with support from our team, which is wonderful, but how well are they utilised? So that might be an interesting area for us to think about as we go forward. Uh, I was interested when I used to work in community more, about the number of basketball hoops we have in some fantastic community halls across the city and county of Swansea area, but how many basketball teams do we actually see playing using those hoops, netball, in these community facilities? So it's interesting questions you, you occurred that occurred to me in my mind then, Dave, and I thank you for that. So on that point, are there, is there anything I've missed, Gareth? Have I missed anything? No, um, obviously we've got item for February. Did you? Did you want to add the outdoor one to, to March, Chair? Yeah, didn't quite yes, happen. It, or we can have a chat afterwards. Right, yes. And and again, as ever, from Helen uh, as the director and Robert Smith as a cabinet member, we'll have some insights there as well. But yes, those were the two that, that seemed to me to, to be the remaining two on the agenda, outdoor education and and um, uh, adverse childhood experiences. And of course, the, the, the closing point for me is that we've invested massively as a council in play facilities. And, and we know that we we push in, I think I'm right to say, three and a half or four million pounds in play facilities across the, the area, which affords wonderful opportunities for all our children, young people and, and adults for that matter. So can I thank you all very much again for what I think was a fascinating meeting. Thanks for your insight and your energy and your questions. I didn't mean to be ageist in saying that. What I said earlier, <laughs> honestly, I didn't. I was thinking about myself. In the old days when parents would, it was acceptable for parents to kick you out in the morning and say, don't come home it, until it's dark. I don't think that's, I don't think I'd be smiling at my daughter if she said that, or my kids, if they said that to my grandchildren, you know, <laughs> but it was okay years ago. Um, so thanks everyone for your commitment and uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.